It is Bible study and prayer time here at Chatham Heights Baptist Church. And I'm grateful that you're joining me either right now, live at 12 o'clock noon, or perhaps later at your own um, time frame and schedule along the way. We are going to continue our series in looking at the seven deadly sins. And today we're going to talk about greed. So, uh, you know, hope you'll be thinking along those lines in just a moment when we take a look and, uh, and address that particular sin uh, that affects all of our lives at some time or another. I, I guarantee that. I um, want to briefly tell you, though, last week was fantastic. Vacation Bible school. Uh, what more can really be said? Uh, we had 77 students. We had 48 workers. So, uh, you know, the, or was it 40s? Either way, uh, it's it's about 120 some total, and we raised $607 for uh, our missionaries that are in Uganda. Uh, so I hope and pray that you will uh, just uh, pray pray for the the spirit that came out of that event and out of that week to continue uh, in the people's lives who were a part of the event uh, and the young people who were a part of the event and the adults who were and for all of us to find ways in which God will grow something fruitful out of that week uh, of work. I, I can't thank enough uh, Rhonda Purvis and her daughter-in-law Renee and directing and, and um, uh, assistant director for the VBS. I can't thank enough all the people who worked, whether it was uh, in departments like rec or crafts or kitchen or missions or in the classes themselves I, I, and music. Uh, I can't thank enough for that. It, it was just a fantastic week. <laughs> so I hope that you will uh, see that God is still at work. And God is still doing something uh, around us at Chatham Heights Baptist Church and in our lives. So we continue to pray for what God is doing. And uh, I thank you for your prayers and support uh, for that week last week. We're going to talk about greed today. And we hear a lot about it. Probably the first thing that I can recall that standing out that uses the, the term greed uh, is from the classic uh, late 1980s movie entitled Wall Street. It starred Michael Douglas and, um, uh, oh, he went crazy. What was, um, Charlie Sheen. Uh, I had to think about it for a second. Um, there is one, uh, it, it dealt with the, um, the great uh, Wall Street Raiders uh, at, who made a lot of money and a lot of their bones on... Uh, uh, buying weak companies and liquidating them for their assets and then throwing them out. Um, and in one particular scene, uh, there is a uh, the main character um, Charlie Sheen is there, but his his new, his hero Gecko, played by Michael Douglas, uh, is talking to the uh, shareholders of Teldar Paper, of which he's trying to. Uh, do a hostile takeover of and then liquidate it. Um, the, uh, there is a time when Gecko is, is talking to the, uh, to the people that are present there. And he has this one phrase in his, in his speech in which he says, for lack of a better term, greed is good. And I thought that was a good summation, probably of uh, the feelings of the late 80s, uh, and myself included, or anybody uh, in that, that was, you know, becoming young adult in that era and time and becoming a, an older adult as you went. Um, you know, greed was rampant in a lot of ways, uh, just as it is today. It, it is something that was long before that as well. Greed has always been with us. But what is it? Well, there's a fancy word for greed that uh, is called avarice. Boy, that makes it sound so much better, doesn't it? Avarice. I, I've used that word on occasion. And one particular occasion, I was 
semi lecturing a group of people who were I thought letting greed get the best of them and I told them that they should stop you know showing their avarice and a friend of mine said Mike that 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 avarice thing went right over their head so um, but the truth is as nice as the word avarice sounds it doesn't hide the truth of the sin itself if you haven't noticed during our series of uh, discussions about the seven deadly sins um, the sin that we talk about is often the distortion of something that is good sin a lot of times takes place when we're given something good and it becomes distorted over magnified uh, imbalanced in, in our lives uh, perhaps nothing is more clearly than the sin of greed. In each of our sins, God gives us something in a proper measure, and the context, and when the context is good, but then our desires turn that gift into evil. Um, if you look at me, uh, or if you're looking in Scripture today, you can um, look in uh, Luke's Gospel. In uh, in fact, it is in. Um, uh, Luke uh, in chapter 12 uh, beginning uh, the last part of verse 16 um, he tells the story of a rich man uh, and it begins with two brothers who are squabbling over their inheritance Jesus tells him he won't preside over their greed and then he proceeds to tell them this story that the land of a rich man was very productive and he began reasoning to himself and he said what shall I do then since I have no place left to store all of my crops that would give him more wealth. Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down the barns I have and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. So take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God says to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own all these things you have prepared for? And Jesus looks at them and says, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and yet is not rich towards God. Greed has long been represented as grabbing hands. Uh, in art and in symbolism claws even have represented greed literature is filled with examples of greed Tolstoy the great Russian writer told the story of a man who was once uh, informed that he could have as much land as he could run around in one day and so he set off to encircle this plot of land that he wanted and as the day wore on he Farther, ventured farther out, the circle growing larger and larger, and he was compelled by the thoughts of all the land that he could have, and he would have if he could just widen the circumference of the circle. And so stride by stride, mile by mile, until at sunset, he is near the completion of his task, and he has run around many, many acres of land, thousands. And he staggers and falls dead of a heart attack. That's greed. Greed is the love of possessing that is so great that you order yourself and being around possessing all you can while closing your eye to the neighbor. Paul called covetousness in Colossians 3, 5, idolatry now idolatry is anything that takes the place of God I mean it's bad enough to make the Ten Commandments when we are told plainly not to covet what the neighbor has and then the Proverbs even state from the least to the greatest everyone is greedy for unjust gain you know sometimes greed is just blatant one of the great stories that would illustrate that is in first Kings chapter 21 and it is in that time 
in which Ahab and Jezebel are king and queen of the kingdom. And you may recall them from our Old Testament study. They were pretty nasty individuals. Jezebel was really nasty. Ahab was just uh, a lutz. I mean, he just he he, he just went along. Uh, I don't think he ever thought too much more than he should have thought, you know, or thought he, you know, should be involved with. But in this particular passage and story of Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab wanted a very pretty piece of property that was adjacent to his property. And he tried buying it off of the owner whose name was Naboth. But Naboth wasn't selling. Naboth didn't want to sell, no matter what the price was. He wasn't going to sell it. He didn't sell because it, to do so would break the family inheritance line. And it would be contrary, in his opinion, to what God wanted for he and his family. So Ahab went home and he sulked about it, pouted. Then Jezebel, his queen, told him to grow up. You know, you need to learn to exercise your authority as the king. So together they came up with a plan, a ruse, in which they falsely accused Naboth of a crime and ended up getting the state, the government that Ahab was in charge of to execute Naboth on these false charges. After the funeral, Ahab took possession of that vineyard he wanted in the first place. So he commits a murder for material gain, all because of greed, not because he didn't have anything, he just didn't have enough in his mind. He just wanted everything. Chaucer, the great English writer and storyteller in his famous Canterbury Tales, had the character of the partner to tell the story about greed. He talked about how three men had found this chest of gold. One of them goes back and says, we need to celebrate. So he goes back to town and he buys wine and he buys bread for supper. And while he is away, the other two began to say, you know, there's a lot here, but there would be even more for us if we were dividing it in half instead of in thirds. So they scheme together and they decide, uh, you know, that when he comes back, they will jump on him and kill him, the one who's gone to get the bread and the wine. And that's exactly what they do. They kill one third of them. You know, the, the, the guy had gone to get it. So then in order to celebrate their newfound wealth of going from thirds to halves, they sat down and they drank the wine, but they did not know that that man they just killed that was one of their partners had poisoned the wine. He was going to do them in. So at the end of the story in, in Chaucer's Tales, here they were, a treasure, a, a box filled with gold and treasure, and three bodies laying around it. All three killed for greed. Nothing more. It's been a long, classic part of a lot of things. Music. I, I remember hmm, 71, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, I think the name of the artist was Coven, but I'm sure Tim or Tom Hall would let me know who that would if that's right or not uh but there was a song called one tin soldier it told the story of of uh, uh, a people of uh, a kingdom that was in the mountains and a kingdom in the valley and the valley people wanted uh, they'd heard long about this treasure that the mountain people had and and so they finally decided they were going to do something about it and they sent up word for the mountain people to give them the treasure and the mountain people send back the word we will be glad to share our treasure with all of our brothers everywhere. But that wasn't enough. So the valley people grabbed their armies together, rode up the mountain, and killed every single one of the mountain people. And when they came to the spot where the treasure was said to lie, they moved a rock, and what they found on a stone was written the, uh, simply the phrase, Peace on Earth. And that's all it said. That was the treasure. Greed perverts the good treasures of our life. Greed is a problem even for God's people. It's as ancient as the Exodus stories and the wilderness stories in the Old Testament. Remember the Hebrews escaped Egypt and they wandered around in the wilderness, but God saw to it 
that they had enough to feed them and enough to keep them alive during that time. So one of the things he did was he sent manna that would appear in the mornings uh, that was from heaven. It was a bread-like substance from heaven. And each day the children of Israel were to go and to collect and scrape together enough manna for themselves and their family for one day, for that day. And then if they if it was uh if it was friday the day before the sabbath the shabbat then they would collect enough for two days god would give them each enough for two days so that they wouldn't have to work on the sabbath and they were warned if you collect more than you are in need of then the surplus and all of it will decay and be filled with worms and those who didn't follow the directive instead trusted their greed more than God's provision discovered that's exactly what would happen. They would have nothing for the day because it rotted before them as they took more than they should have. Surplus rots. How many times have you been to the fridge in my household just as bad? Oh, we're going to put that in there. We'll, we'll save it and we'll eat it uh, tomorrow night. And tomorrow night comes, well already fixed this so we're going to save it for the next night and uh well we went out to eat that night so the next and after about five days when there's this hairy stuff growing all over it <laughs> you realize that um you know you, you you didn't you know you kept surplus but you didn't do anything with it first john three seventeen reminds us but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So if you have something and you ignore others who have not, how does the love of God dwell in you? Pretty blunt if you think about it, pretty straightforward. And I'm not the one asking the question, God is. Greed wants more, it is insatiable. We've all seen it perhaps lived it, experienced it, maybe even practiced it without noticing. Um, personal moment, I guess I should say. Uh, a little of my family history, so to speak, in my own personal history. I, um, when my grandmother uh, Hatfield died in 2010, uh, my right. uncle Bob, there were only two children they had, my father, who died in 87, and my Uncle Bob, who was the only surviving child. Um, Bob came up to me after the funeral, probably a little more embraced by spirit, <laughs> uh, but came up to me to tell me that I need to talk to you and your sister, Mike, because Manny and Pat took really good care of all three of us. And before I left, uh, was to leave to come back to Virginia at that time, he, he, uh, wanted, uh, he wanted to make sure we all got together. He was going to get the will out of the safe box on that Monday. And if Margaret and I could meet him at lunch or whatever, so I did. And, you know, I remembered the will because my grandfather had showed it to me in the early 90s, uh, some years after my dad's death, because they had changed their will and they wanted to honor both of their sons, even one who was no longer alive. Uh, by leaving half of everything to, uh, you know, Bobby and half of everything to the branches of JC, which would be my sister and I. Um, but when we went with Bobby, he, he wouldn't show us the will. And he's, he said, well, there's been a few changes and I'll, I'll get with you about it. Don't worry about it. And so I, I felt like the right thing to do is to trust him. He was now the, the leader of the clan, so to speak. And, um, Personally, I, I figured long ago there had been changes. It made sense. He had he had moved in with my grandmother and stayed there for nine years and looked after a lot of her care. He had gotten his daughters to take care of personal needs for Mammy and and um, you know it had been nine years since my grandfather died. So um, Bob said he'd be in touch and he wasn't. I I never heard from him. Uh, and 
then that Christmas, which would you know be some 10 months later, um, he told me there was nothing uh, for my sister I and that things had been changed in the will. I accepted it just as the way it was. Then four months later, my father-in-law, Joe Chance, died. And as Susan and I and, and my in-laws, Ramona and Daryl, were at the courthouse trying to, to establish and fix things for Joe's estate and, and setting things up, I, curiosity got the better of me, so I went down to the uh, archives and I, I, I pulled up the will that had been filed for my grandmother. And what I found was it was the exact same will that they had crafted, she and my grandfather, in 1989 and had signed together. It was everything I remembered it. So I wondered what was going on. And and it was already settled. It had already gone through probate and the judge had already dismissed everything and, and it was done. So I, I found the attorney of record and I went to her office and I talked with her. And, and um, what she shared with me, because my name was on the will, she could legally do that. Um, was all of the investments that they had um, over the years, uh, over those nine years that were of my grandfather and grandmother's. Um, every time over those nine years when those investments matured, Bobby had convinced my grandmother that to go to the bank with him and to uh, change the investments to joint accounts with her name and his name, which legally meant when she died, there was nothing that was just hers. It was all his. Um, it was legal. The lawyer said, even if you'd known this, there was nothing you could do to stop it. Um, and once she died, there was no legal recourse to what was going on. Well, the interesting thing is there was enough there for at least some significant altering lifestyle um, that all three parties would have been able to be blessed from, I guess is a good way to put it. The problem was Bobby wanted it all. Why? He was always a used car dealer. I mean, literally was. Uh, and I guess because he thought he could do it. It was the thrill of doing it. The interesting thing is, in his life, he never spent it. At least not a lot of it. Um, and when he died, he didn't have a will. And it was left to his nine children to fight over all that was left. And greed was at the root of everything and the fractured family that he left behind it you know literally it, it was chaos and I uh, you know some of my cousin a couple of my cousins I'm close to most I'm not but you know it was it was just difficult to watch their the greed they inherited from their father in fact the oldest child Tim who that's another story in and of itself. He lived in California, but the, had come back and become entrusted again by his uh, half-siblings. Um, basically, he embezzled a lot of it. And, and because he never came back to Kentucky, never was able to be held accountable for it because of state laws and what have you. I guess the greed goes on and on, some people. Now, don't think I'm an innocent ma martyr in the story. The truth is I found myself for those 10 months and then later after discovering the shenanigans, wrapped up in my own sort of greed of thinking what could be and then afterwards thinking of what should have been. And I think that's something I probably still struggle with today is to understand that to depend on God rather than these things uh, upon the good gifts that God has given me over the temporal things the world brings 
that creates distortion of what is good. The only answer to greed is found in Jesus. And trusting God's hand over our own, over our own conniving, over our own scheming, even our own fiscal abilities. It's finding contentment of today rather than tomorrow's gold mine. If you were to look back at that Lucan text we read from at the start, Jesus continued on and kind of gives us an important understanding of how to keep greed at bay. In verse 22 of that 12th chapter, he said, Jesus said to his disciples, he turned to them now and talks to them. It's for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on, for life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider instead the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life's span? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toll nor spin. But I tell you, Jesus says, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you men of little faith. Do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. The rich fool from the parable had forgot about these things. He forgot that all he had was a gift from God, and he assumes his riches are his and his alone. In fact, when you looked at the earlier part of that chapter, you discovered that the parable includes... The pronouns I and my 13 times. I or my 13 times out of a 61 word story. You know what we call that? Self-absorbed. Greed happens when we get stuck in the first person singular. When we have no thoughts of others or even of God. And the result is that death comes and shatters our illusion because death comes to us all. And Jesus points out it comes when we least expect it. Like other sins, greed is once an obstacle uh, to God's grace. You see, the gifts that come from God, like grace or resources are meant to flow outward and not become a reservoir inwardly only. Greed blocks the flow of God's goodness to the rest of creation. So a good theology of being a conduit and a steward of God's graciousness is very important to our relationship with God and with others. We do so because we've learned that God provides enough so to take care of us. We trust God because God is trustworthy. Another solution is perhaps in discovering the joy of self-giving. When we spend a lifetime practicing grace, giving it leaves us with little worry about the accumulation of stuff. When his children were young, the evangelist Tony Campalo and his wife used to take his children at Christmas time every year to Haiti. They didn't wrap the kids uh, in a lot of toys and gifts, but they took them there so they could meet the families and the children of Haiti, particularly the ones their monies had been supporting through missions that were taking place there. They would meet the impoverished and the wounded who needed to see someone to care for them. Years later, as the children got older, Campalo talked about, the family went well out of their way to a village and a school They'd sent their Christmas money to that year. And when they arrived, many of the students met them there at the door, aware of everything this family had done. 
and they embraced them all and they hugged them all with thanksgiving and gratitude. And as the Kimpalo family got back into their Jeep and headed back towards the capital city of Port-au-Prince, the children were silent for a long ways. Puzzled, Tony said he asked, okay kids, what's wrong? Nothing, one of them said. It's just we were thinking that there's really nothing we could have done with our money over the last 10 years that would have made us happier than we are right now. Greed is dangerous, but it is not an unconquerable sin. But remember, it is dangerous. For it is greed that put Jesus on a cross. Well, yes, Mike, all says no. I'm being specific here. If you were going to really look at a specific sin that put Jesus on the cross by the people who were around him, uh, one of the top motivations has to be greed. Think about it. The man, the disciple who betrays him is Judas. What do we know of Judas? We know that Judas was the keeper of the purse, the treasurer. And according to Scripture, particularly in John's Gospel, we find that he'd take a little bit here and a few there when he pleased greed. The Pharisees and the Sanhedrin wanted Jesus on that cross. Why? Well, because remember, he'd just been in the temple turning over all of their money changing tables, which were commerce for the, the temple. You brought in your animals to sacrifice. You purchased them there at exorbitant prices. Uh, you changed your regular money out for temple money. Usually, by this time, one of the corrupt practices was to the exchange rate very much benefited the clergy, the temple, the Pharisees, and not the worshipers. Greed. And our own greed put Jesus there. For when we felt as long as we got ours, we didn't care about the others, greed ends up putting Jesus there. We may not go as far as Ahab. We may not kill our neighbor, Naboth. But our own greed kills our souls and our hearts. I mean, it's time to become honest with ourselves and know that when we flirt with that line of need to greed, we're in danger of crucifying Jesus anew in ourselves. And that's the danger taking a look at our prayer concerns today I ask that you would uh, remember a few people here um, Harless Gardner his, his brother Harold passed away over the weekend the funeral was yesterday down in Lexington North Carolina but please remember Harless in your prayers and his family as well Maddie Cruz Belt, our, our long, uh, long time part of our church and been homebound for a number of years. Uh, her family had to move her to Mulberry Creek Assisted Living. And so she is there uh, now instead of in her home. But remember Maddie, remember her family as they are trying to take care of one another as well as Maddie. So please lift them up in your prayers. Charles Lewis had one doctor's appointment yesterday I believe he has one tomorrow and Friday or some two more I know at least this week as he prepares for a surgery coming in a few weeks and I ask that you continue to remember he and Ida in your prayers and Peggy Harris as she continues to recover from her surgery. So reminder that Sunday we restart Sunday school. So we're restarting Sunday school on Sunday. And uh, hope that you will be able to come and join one of your classes uh, at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Let's bow together. Lord God, there is much in our lives that we dress up with the words of self-interest. But sometimes we cross the line into the greed of needing just more. We are all guilty of that, Lord, sometimes. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit that not only convicts us, 
your spirit would redeem us as well. Before you, we have lifted just a few names for prayer. There are many others that are not spoken, and we pray for them as well. And we will trust you, O oh Lord, in the midst of all that is taking place in their lives. So now, Lord, as we go out into this world, may we model the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we bring to others the power of the presence of your Holy Spirit. For it's in the name of your Son that we pray. Amen. I hope and pray you have a pleasant rest of the week. And we look forward to worshiping again together this Sunday.